because I think there is only a handful of basic scientists in, in the room, and because you know I'm, I'm not a basic scientist myself, I decided to have only two slides on basic science. Um, and that, although uh, as a, the HIV science conference, we uh, this time there was a, a, a quite a very a, quite a, not quite a very, very good representation of. Um, HIV science in Mexico City, uh, covering topics such as cellular tissue reservoirs, latency reversing agents, remission, hormonal influences on HIV and primary infection. I'm going to have just one or two slides on primary infection because I think um, many of us here are either clinicians or program managers and this is very, very relevant. Even touched on the fact that uh, you know we need to do more same-day ARTs um, on, along those lines, uh, we need to do more to recognize primary infection and start ART as early as possible because what that does is it limits the reservoir size. As you know, one of the problems um, uh, that uh, you know, we, we, we're having in terms of cure or in terms of uh, um, uh, relapse in that sense of the word is because there's this large <coughs> HIV reservoir even in people who are uh, virus suppressed. And importantly, uh, early ART initiation will also preserve uh, the HIV specific immunity, reduces immune activation and exhaustion. So all very, very important reason. In Malaysia, um, I think we need to do more to educate, particularly our colleagues in uh, general practice who generally are the people at the front line of um, of patients coming in with uh, acute primary infection, which can, of course, resemble dengue uh, and many other uh, community infections. Having that in mind, having primary infection, could it be primary infection, is, is very, very important. Um, and we need to do more to educate our colleagues out there to think about primary uh, HIV infection because uh, treatment has to be started early. So, um, oh, I have one slide on basic science. This is the summary slide. Um, there are a lot of promises. Uh, there's a, range, a whole range of new latency reversing agents, meaning, um, you know, in the search for cure, this latency reversing agent is going to be very, very important, as well as immunotherapeutics. Um, but the challenges, you know, as we all know, for the last four decades, the virus is a very smart one. Um, and the breadth of cell types and tissues forming the reservoir um, will need uh, a lot more clever people to, to think beyond the shocking kill. There's, there's, I mean, Rina is an expert in, in cure in this room and uh, it would give a much better talk in terms of the approaches uh, to finding a cure, um, whether it's uh, shocking to, to, to push the viruses out of the reservoirs and then um, kill them as, as it says here or to uh, address the, the latency as, um, as a strategy for cure. So moving along to something that's probably more close to your hearts uh, for the clinicians and the program managers in the room, the clinical sciences. So there was a lot of focus on the DTG um, and the neural tube defects. Um, that was uh, the, the big news last year. Um, how can we simplify treatment, um, co-infections, and uh, moving forward with some new investigational agents? <coughs> I uh, took out the slides on the investigational agents, but uh, you know, um, four decades of HIV now we have so so many uh, antiretroviral therapies, and we're getting more, including uh, long-acting injectables, etc. Um, which will uh, hopefully address uh, some of the problems we're uh, addressing at the moment. In comparison, actually, antimicrobials, antibacterial, is, is not um, getting as much attention as uh, HIV. So neural tube defects, which uh, became big news um, back in 2018 with the Spamon study um, and birth outcomes. So. Uh, what then happened was that there was this big um, uh, surveillance uh, to, to, to see what really is the uh, prevalence of neural tube defects in childbearing women using um, donatelovir. And uh, so the, the 
extended um, uh, results or analysis of the um, uh, study showed that um, in women who were using, who were taking the Dovotecovir, the percentage with neural tube defect was 0.30% um, versus 0.3 versus uh, those uh, using ephedrine uh, was uh, 0.04, so lower. But um, when you look at it uh, and compared it with um, the overall incidence of, uh, oh sorry, the overall prevalence of uh, neural tube defects, uh, really it's no, um, no major difference. It's consistent with background rates of, uh, of neural tube defects in countries with um, food folic acid supplementation. So, zero, oops, sorry. 0.01 to 0.08 is kind of the range of, uh, of neural tube defects that you would expect. So at 0.03, um, it was felt that um, um, you know it's still safe to recommend dolatecrevir as the uh, backbone for um, first line treatment. So adults and adolescents initiating ART. Um, strong recommendation, moderate certainty evidence, and this is a new uh, WHO guideline, so Febrans at low dose 400 milligrams uh, is recommended as an alternative first line regime. Now in Malaysia, I think we are still using very high doses of Febrans um, because you know we don't have the uh, low dose. And there's going to be a whole session on, um, on Febrans. I mean, on uh, antiretroviral therapy. Now, moving along, um, we need better and better um, first-line regimes. So, advanced study looked at, uh, compared um, a Fabrance uh, based regime with uh, Dolatagravir, large study uh, looking at uh, alternative to Fabrance. So, what they found was um, uh, higher frequency of uh, emergence of resistance in the Fabrance arm, and uh, not surprisingly, a higher rate of uh, grade three and four adverse events in the Fabrance arm, something that all of us uh, uh, clinicians experience, with, particularly with neurotoxicity. So hence, um, the uh, recommendation for uh, DTG now as first line. <coughs> what about simplifying uh, these regimens? So, can we do two drugs? So, uh, an exciting study, Gemini 1 and 2, just using dolatagravir with 3TC, um, was shown to be non inferior to dolatagravir with uh, uh, Truvada in a 48 week primary, primary analysis, very low biological failure, no treatment emergent resistance. So, this is, I think, um, you know, the, the, the next uh, exciting development in antiretroviral therapy. Obviously, we will need more studies to see if this uh, uh, holds through. The other is using two drugs for maintenance. The other one is for naive patients. So this is for maintenance using, again, uh, DTG and 3TC in a study called Tango. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing phase three non-inferiority trial. Um, what they found was non-inferiority of the two drug regime and uh, one viro virology failure in the TAP arm um, and no viral rebound. So again, uh, two drugs, whether it's for uh, initiation of treatment uh, in naive patients or for maintenance is um, exciting new development in antiretroviral therapy. Um, other ways to simplify treatment would be long-acting injectable ART, this one using carbotegravir and rilpivirine versus uh, three-drug treatment in a study called ATLAS. Um, tolerability, frequency and acceptance of ejection site improved significantly from baseline to week 48 and those on the uh, carbotegravir and rilpivirine arm showed significant improvement demonstrated significantly greater improvement from baseline treatment satisfaction. So, you know, initially, um, 
uh, it wasn't so well received, but as uh, treatment went along, um, and in fact, 97% preferred injectable treatment to oral treatment <coughs> as the trial progressed. So, the next, uh, moving from antiretroviral therapy to co-infections, TB, as you know, uh, remains uh, a huge problem even here in Malaysia and, and I believe uh, in the region as well. Remains underdiagnosed, uh, so nearly half a million people with TB in um, people living with HIV, still very, very large numbers of death and, and uh, TB has surpassed HIV as uh, the main cause of death uh, globally. Late HIV diagnosis and treatment Initiation contributes to the high incidence um, and late presentation associated with a six-fold increase in risk of incident TB. Um, you know, the, 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 the big studies of, of TB co-infection um, took place uh, several years ago and uh, uh, this is a retrospective study looking at uh, ART initiation. Of course, uh, I think many of you know that uh, early treatment is favorable, although that needs to be balanced against uh, uh, the emergence of iris. Um, so in this uh, presentation, it was a, a large retrospective study involving six countries, which showed that ART initiation within eight weeks of TB treatment reduced the risk of um, unfavorable TB outcomes by 65% in children and adolescents with HIV. So uh, another argument for not delaying TB treatment in patients with HIV on treatment. What about what drugs to use? Uh, oh, yeah, when we, we, we have very limited um, drugs again in, in our region. So this was this one looked at uh, it's, uh, an ANRS funded study looking at uh, afavirenz and uh, <coughs> uh, TB regimens um, comparing afavirenz with um, with valtegravir. And uh, it looks like afavirenz still should be considered as a preferred first line therapy for co-infected patients because the non-inferiority complex, I mean, criteria for was was not met in um, the retagravir arm. So the, as you can see, the pink uh, bar there uh, with retagravir compared to the afavirenz arm. Okay, this is my own uh, uh, area that I think we need to do better, my own sort of be in the bonnet area that I think we should uh, pay more attention to and do better in is uh, treatment of latent TB, whether for um, people living with HIV or, or people uh, without HIV. So the UN High Level Meeting in uh, 2018 uh, member countries made a commitment to provide better TB preventive therapy to 6 million people uh, living with HIV and uh, TB. I mean, 6 million people living with, with HIV. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of exciting new science in, uh, in TB treatment in general, but TB prevention. And, uh, you know, the, the, the treatment regimes are getting shorter and shorter and better and better. Um, three months of isoniazid isoniazid rifam, uh, rifapentine um, is, is been shown to be safe and effective and can be used with either Vavarenz or Dolitegravir. Now it's getting even shorter. Um, one month is easy, safe and effective and again can be used with uh, Vavarenz. So we, we really need to do more in terms of uh, uh, providing uh, TB prophylaxis in uh, in NIHG, HIV, uh, uh, people living with HIV in Malaysia and in, in the region. Um, except rifapentin is of course very, very uh, expensive. Um, but I guess if the demand uh, increases, then perhaps uh, we, we can advocate for cheaper drugs, so it's a chicken and egg kind of thing all the time with these pharma companies. Um, Okay, so uh, just to summarize, 
lots and lots of good uh, clinical science in Mexico City. Um, Dolatrevia, neural tube defects associated with Dolatrevia, Dolatrevia occur lower frequency, frequency than first reported. Um, it's now, as you all know, is uh, first line recommendation <coughs> from WHO. Um, a lot of effort being put into simplifying ART regimes and uh, Possibly in the next few years, we will start seeing two drug regimens um, and newer long lasting agents, including injectable treatment, um, will probably also start coming onto the scene um, in the next few years. And then, of course, we need um, better tolerated first line regimes for TB co infection, and we need to scale up um, uh, prophylaxis, TB prophylaxis, uh, in, in people living with HIV. Track C was on prevention signs, uh, which received, uh, track D was the one which received the, the biggest number of submissions. But uh, again, prevention signs, there was a, a, a lot of exciting presentations, um, a lot of focus on PrEP implementation, um, and uh, issues around key populations and self testings and, and uh, new interventions. So, <coughs> one of the things uh, I wanted to highlight, this is also something that uh, Howie, my, my <coughs> colleagues at Cheria, Howie, Ronzian, and uh, Ezra have done a, a, a nice study looking at the syndemics of, uh, of HIV in the Malaysian uh, MSM population with very, very um, kind of uh, troubling findings in terms of the levels of mental health and depression and even suicidal ideation. Uh, amongst uh, local MSM, and uh, this is uh, the, the, um, a combination of studies from uh, Latin America and uh, South Africa, which showed kind of similar uh, findings to that, uh, what we had in, in KL. So Latin American MSM survey, 13.6% reported use of drugs to enhance sexual experience, 72% uh, reported unprotected anal intercourse, 53% uh, had an STI diagnosis, and the rate of uh, PrEP usage was uh, negligible, so 2.6%. In Zimbabwe and South Africa, uh, depression and substance use, um, less than 5% prevalence of uh, substance use in Africa, well, um, but I believe the, the, there's increasing use of uh, substance uh, in, in, South in, in South Saharan Africa that's taking place. And can you imagine the, the collision of uh, injecting drug use and, and substance use in, in already um, uh, high levels of uh, HIV prevalence is, is going to be another problem for South Africa. And uh, for, for higher risk of biological failure in substance uses, which is also something that uh, has been reported in, in other cohorts. Higher rate of depression among Peruvian MSM, more than 40% of MSM screened at community HIV service had depressive symptoms. Again, something I think uh, we don't uh, address very well. We don't screen for it very well as clinicians. Um, and uh, something that uh, needs uh, urgent in terms of uh, MSM, this is a, a study from Latin America, mirrors uh, very much, uh, in my opinion, what, what is happening in uh, Asia as well. So um, prevalence of MSM in Latin America, 5 to 10 percent in ages 5, 15 to 24 with um, high incidence, so 3 percent per year, low levels of testing, low levels of condom use. And uh, as Eamon mentioned, changes in technologies is uh, facilitating, um, you know, networking, etc. And so we need to find new ways of uh, addressing all of that. So similar to what's happening in Asia, low access to prep and low levels of awareness. The uh, the the study, one of the studies that. Uh, uh, confirms that PrEP works and uh, scale up of PrEP is, is urgent is uh, a study from Andrew Gulick from Kirby Institute um, and how 
uh, with the rollout of PrEP in New South Wales, in, in Sydney and, and other uh, cities in New South Wales. Um, they did a um, uh, uh, prospective study um, and followed up 90,690 person years of follow up. There were 30 infections in a very, very large cohort of um, Australians on PrEP. And those who developed, uh, who became infected with HIV with an incidence of 1.52 per thousand years, um, all the serial converters had stopped taking PrEP. Um, and that the incidence was strongly associated with baseline rectal STI and ATS use. So, um, in terms of for, for Australia, which of course is one of the poster countries for HIV elimination and rollout of PrEP, rollout of antiretroviral treatment, and other um, uh, prevention <coughs> programs, what, what they felt that they need to do is um, that to actually achieve HIV elimination in Australia, which they, they're aiming to, to do, um, they will need to get a cut, PrEP coverage of more than 75%. Um, and the focus, I was at Asham a few months ago, that the focus um, will need to be on um, those who are less connected with health systems in Australia, such as migrants and visitors to, to Australia. And, uh, and addressing why people stop prep. Some new prevention <coughs> products. So long at, again, the uh, long-acting carotegravir is not going to be just useful for treatment, obviously, but uh, uh, will play a role in uh, prevention. And uh, uh, I won't belabor that because I've already been told. I'm running out of time. Um, Self-testing, uh, which uh, will be a focus for one of the group works uh, tomorrow, and, and I think this is, as, as you've all heard, this is where we need to put our energy and focus on uh, to kind of bypass the, the traditional conservatism and and, uh, and the barriers that we face uh, doing it the, the usual way. So this is from uh, a study from. Burundi. Uh, so, so um, in, in Africa, so peer outreach um, distributed kits yeah, between December 2018 and March 2019, and 22% uh, of HIV diagnoses in in uh, Burundi at the time, in the last female sex workers uh, were diagnosed by this modality, and 35% uh, in MSM was also diagnosed through peer outreach uh, um, delivered um, self-testing um, programs. So very, very important way to reach out to those most at risk. So in terms of track C prevention, um, there was, uh, with, with apologies to our, to our transgender colleagues in the room, there was uh, um, quite a number of presentations on HIV prevention and treatment in transgender. Um, uh, basically, the message was we need to um, provide gender affirmative uh, care for testing as well as treatment and, and prep access for transgender people. Uh, high incidence of, uh, as mentioned, high incidence in young men who have sex with men in Latin America and Asia, very, very similar uh, epidemics. Therefore, highlights the case for wider PrEP provision. Uh, PrEP, uh, not surprisingly, in big cohort studies, uh, particularly in Australia, shows very high effectiveness. There are um, there are uh, sort of uh, hope that, that there is hope, uh, you know, with with uh, injectables and implants that could perhaps uh, improve uh, PrEP delivery and adherence. Um, and in terms of, uh, I'm not going to touch vaccine at all, but uh, just uh, to say that there is uh, quite a bit of work uh, and investment going to, into HIV vaccine, and there's a phase three study, big phase three study now well underway, and HIV self-testing is something that, along with PrEP, that we in this region will uh, need to seriously invest in and uh, roll out ASAP. Track D. 
um, social behavioral implementation science. Uh, there were this was the largest uh, we, we received the largest abstract. I guess we should see the largest abstract for KDT, <coughs> and it was very difficult to really pick um, the, the the abstracts with the you know high quality many many abstracts uh, submitted. And I'm going to just uh, and and. There are many around implementation science and program design, uh, funding and sustainability, the importance of community involvement, um, you know, how do we address stigma and uh, improving engagement in care through reaching the untested and um, <coughs> highlights were also on why uh, people discontinue PrEP and uh, what to do about it. Just slapping my, my last two slides. We'll, we'll probably also uh, be discussed in the panel on access to antiretroviral therapy. Um, the, the cost uh, is uh, going down, and here in South Africa, a uh, combination of uh, tenofovir 50C and dolotegravir can now be at 80 US dollars, as opposed to 247 US dollars. So I think we as a as a community in the region and, and specifically in Malaysia, we really need to see how we can access uh, dollar tegravir at a much cheaper rate than what we're doing at the moment. We've done it before in the early days of uh, antiretroviral treatment, and, um, you know, medical compulsory licensing. But now I think there are other avenues uh, to look at for us to access um, a cheaper antiretroviral treatment. And not surprisingly, with the low price, uh, there are more numbers of uh, people accessing treatment. This is uh, on uh, prep pro program design, um, basically saying that uh, the involvement and participation of the community is critical for programmatic success. Uh, this is amongst uh, black and Latin American men in New York City to so what they did was um, uh, involve uh, participants were recruited from on, online, um, but uh, they were asked to join a Facebook and Instagram uh, group online and uh, you know, they were involved in an online campaign of prep uh, designed by uh, the community, delivered by the community kind of uh, model. So, last slide on uh, on track D. Uh, you know, accurate data is very very important. There were some examples, and I think we've got people from uh, we've got colleagues from linkages who are also doing uh, very nice work in the region on uh, on on linking uh, treatment data and, and uh, hopefully it's something we can learn from. So accurate and timely data is at the core of good programming and and drives improve uh, treatment outcomes. Involvement of the community, I don't think uh, we need to say that, but I, I suppose it needs to be once again uh, emphasized that uh, you know, community involvement in, in program design and delivery is critical to success, um, with numerous examples of successful interventions, including in uh, testing and care. Challenges remain, uh, this is the, Particularly in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, they really are having trouble uh, in, in a generalized epidemic. Um, the uh, trouble engaging men in testing, prevention, and treatment as compared to women in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, sustainability of the HIV response requires prioritization of interventions. Uh, you know, although dear Margaret um, talked about you know awareness among Margaret has been working in Cheria for more than 20 years, Margaret, and yes. totally as a, as a research nurse, yes. um, completely passionate about uh, prevention, treatment and care. I mean, rightfully highlighted the fact that we need to educate our young, but uh, in terms of resource uh, allocation, uh, you know, targeting it to uh, not, not just generalise um, of course, awareness campaign is very important, but where the epidemic is, and in Malaysia, it's amongst key population, and I think that's where our 
resource and energy uh, needs to be put in, and, and likewise, I think, in other countries in the region. So that's what uh, that message is in terms of prioritizing interventions. Stigma and legal context are mutually reinforcing and excessive risk. Legal and policy reform is essential for risk reduction. So as of, right, as of this morning, right now, um, some of the colleagues who are supposed to be here but now have been dragged to the Ministry of Health uh, to work on a uh, cabinet paper that we're putting in to, um, to advocate for, or more than advocate, to ask the government to um, look into decriminalizing drug use. Um, there's going to be a big cabinet committee cha uh, uh, chaired by the Prime Minister on October 15th, and um, we're working very hard to uh, make sure that at least there is a policy agreement that um, drug use will be considered a health and social issue and not a um, criminal justice issue, and also for the cabinet to form a uh, a task force to look at uh, decrimin decriminalization in Malaysia um, in the next few years. So that's what we're doing in terms of addressing stigma and legal context in Malaysia. One of the things that we're doing.